Okay, so uh, welcome back from lunch. Um, my name's John Howell, I'm from the University of Aberdeen. And I'm gonna, we're gonna change the topic, we're well, not change topic, but we're gonna change focus slightly and go to the other part of the, the other part of the conference, which is about um, what we call the ge virtual geoscience revolution. And I've got a, a talk that's gonna summarize, um, that's gonna summarize where we are and how we got there, or at least a, a personal perspective on where we are and how we got there in terms of what we call the, the virtual geosciences. And then I'm gonna use this as a, as a way of setting up our first round of, uh, of virtual field trips and, and software demos, which will be following straight on. So I'm gonna talk about, as I say, what we call the virtual geoscience revolution. And I'm gonna start off, uh, actually, I'm, not, I'm actually the second person to show this map today. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically maybe make a fairly bold claim, but I, I would say that you know, this map, obviously everybody in the room I'm sure recognizes this map. If you want to see the original, it's just up on the wall over there. And if, and if you're a geologist and this map doesn't send shivers down your spine, then you have no soul. Um, <laughs> the map was obviously, as we all know, put together by this man who was, was, was a pure visionary. And what I'm going to say is that actually um, Smith, he put, his, he put his first map together, published it in 1815, and, it, and it's a truly phenomenal piece of work for one person to, to, to map the whole of uh, England and Wales. And the other, thing is, I, the other thing that amazes me that nobody ever mentions is he didn't even have a car. He had to go everywhere by horse. I mean, even just covering that amount of ground on a horse is, is fairly amazing, let alone making a geological map while you're going. But anyway, so, so he published his first map in 1815, and what I actually would argue, and, and that's, sorry, that's very nicely documented in, in Simon Winchester's book if you haven't read it, but what I'm going to argue is that actually for the next 200 years, nothing changed in terms of fieldwork. I know there's lots of other big massive developments in the earth sciences, but in terms of fieldwork, I'm not that old, but I, when I learned to map, we went out with pencils and a compass and we drew on a piece of paper. And that's effectively what, what Smith did. And I'm gonna say that for, for 200 years, we basically did the same things as, as Smith did. Most of us not as well. And we went out and if we wanted to look at cross sections through the earth, we drew what we call architectural element panels. We wanted to sort of capture geology and, and architectures for reservoir modeling and for reservoir analogs. And we went up and we ran up and down hillsides with measuring poles. Sometimes we took photographs, but overall we just basically drew everything using pencils and paper and we, and we collected data in that way. Um, we spent a lot of time working on, on, on big cliffs. We tried to put scales into some of these. We took photographs, we tried to put scales in. You probably can't really see it on here, but there's a person there, there's a football there on a tape measure. We spent a lot of time wandering around in Utah lowering balls down over cliffs, taking photographs, and then putting those together to make panels to try to get some kind of element of scale into our, into our sort of, into, a, into what we were drawing so we could actually sort of quantify this and transfer it. So this is the 1990s. Those cliffs in Chile, which you saw, this is a fantastic half graben in Chile. It's probably one of the best shallow marine half grabens anywhere in the world. There's a fault scarp there. There's a, there's, there's the, a cross section through the fill of that. And, and for about three weeks, I spent a lot of time hanging on a rope, trying to measure sections and take samples from this, thinking, did I put the handbrake on on the car? Because the, the rope was tied to the car. But also thinking, there has to be a better way of doing this. And basically, what all of that led to, and, 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 and you know, all of this kind of corresponded within, as we passed into the 21st century, into the development of what we call virtual outcrops. And a virtual outcrop is... There's lots of different definitions of it, but my definition is a photorealistic 3D model of a cliff. So this is a, a, an outcrop lots of people might have been to in, in Spain. It's, it's the Ienza Quarry, nice little turbidite channel complexes. And basically, this is a 3D realization of that cliff section. And I can take it in the workstation, I can rotate it around, and I can make measurements. So what I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of a history as to how we got to the point that we can routinely build these. And then I'll talk a little bit about what we can do with them now, and then I'll talk, uh, just end up by saying what we might do with them going into, into the future. So this is a, another virtual outcrop. This one's from Utah this time. It's a, it's a section that's about 100 meters thick. These white sandstones here are shore faces. This is all shallow marine, sorry, this is all coastal plain strata overlain by a big fluvial system. 
and it's a little bit dark on this screen, but basically you get the idea that it's a 3D realization of the geology. Uh, as, as, as they said this morning from Google, it's like Google Earth, but, but higher resolution. You know, I can go in here and measure beds that are a few centimeters thick, and we can do all sorts of cool stuff with that. And, and this is what we call a virtual outcrop, and this is what we're sort of going to be, be discussing. And there's lots of things we can do with this. We can extract geometric data from it to put directly into our reservoir models. Um, we can also make lots of kind of measurements and things like that. We can map things out. We can create surfaces. We can even go as far as sort of creating 3D reservoir style models from these data. And that's just in the reservoir analog. You know, the, these things have application in all sorts of other areas of the geosciences as well. But if we, people say to me, what do you get out of that that you don't get out of some photographs or you don't get out of going to the field? I'd say there's, there's two things. First of all, we have the ability to collect very large volumes of data very, very quickly. And we can do that safely and, and, and we can do that efficiently. You know, I could go and, 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 and abseil up or climb up and down this cliff, but it would take me a long time to collect the data. But, but I can go in here and make all those measurements very quickly or I can get a student to do that. I don't, I don't do my own measurements these days. But, uh, but we can collect large volumes of information from here. The other thing is I would argue that there are data we can get from here that we can't actually get in the field. I don't care how good a field geologist you are. You cannot measure half a degree over five kilometers with a compass clino. But you can very easily measure that and map those kind of features in, in, in the virtual outcrops. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the history. Certainly the first project I was ever involved with that, that, that had a, sort of attempted to collect data digitally was just into the 2000s when we were, I was involved in, um, with a project called the Nomad Project in Liverpool. And we went out and we worked uh, combined with Schlumberger and we had, uh, did a lot of this uh, GPS mapping where we'd set up a base station and then we'd have a person with a little backpack wandering soullessly, lonely around the outcrop trying to map out all of the, uh, all of the kind of bed boundaries. And we used this to, uh, to generate, well, Dave actually there, Dave Hodgett's over there, he, he generated the first kind of digital DEMs that I had certainly ever seen built from outcrop data. And this was all very exciting, it involved a lot of walking. Then I moved to Norway, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I started collaborating with Norse Kidro, who were actually way ahead of the game here. They were, they were collaborating with a guy called Carlos Aitken in, in, in Dallas, and Carlos had actually built a system that took a, 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 the kind of surveying kit, a, I don't know, I forgot the word for it, um, that anyway, one of these things that shoots a laser at the cliff that they use for measuring the roads, and it built a robot, point, a total station, and it built a robot that kind of moved the total station and he could map the cliffs and he could measure several tens of points in a minute and then they'd drape photographs over them. And they produced some, some, some fantastic virtual outcrops. The first time I'd ever really seen proper virtual outcrops from, from outcrops in Spain and, and, and these outcrops here in Ireland. <coughs> For some reason, we still spent a lot of time hanging on ropes around that time. But, but these were the first proper uh, virtual outcrops I, saw, I, I ever saw. And then what these things came along, and this is what I will call the LIDAR revolution. So originally they're kind of designed for architectural surveying. It's, it's a laser scanner. It shoots a laser at the cliff and it moves. But un unlike the, the total station, the robotic to total station, this, this thing here is doing it at 10,000 points a second rather than, rather than a, a, few t a few tens per minute. And ultimately, this, was, this kind of revolutionized how we collect data, because now all of a sudden you could go out, you could collect these very large volumes of point data, you could combine them with digital imagery, and you could start to build the first virtual outcrops, first, or for routinely build the first kind of virtual outcrops. So we were quite heavily involved in this from sort of 2000 on, and, and this is the basic principle. The laser here is shooting the cliff. As it shoots the cliff, uh, we build what we call a point cloud, uh, and then we triangulate that surface, we drape photographs over it, and we've got our textured 3D, 3D model. Back in 2006 or so, we thought it was fantastic. This thing shot 10,000 points a second. We can scan, and it took an hour to do one scan, and we could, we could go around and we could sort of, uh, we could do 12 scans in a day, and it only weighed 80 kilos, and you only needed this many people to go to the field with it. We all thought, this is, we thought yeah, this is fantastic. Um, then... Along came this. This is, this is the next generation laser scanner. This now does 100,000 points a second. Just can't, I can't even get my head around that. But anyway, uh, and it runs off an iPad. And, uh, and, it, and, you, and literally, you know, one person can go to the field with it and carry it. 
So again, we are very excited about this. There's 100,000 points. So each scan now takes five minutes rather than, rather than an hour. And we can do 30 scans in a day, more data. And uh, yeah, and it runs off an iPad. So there's my colleague there, Simon Buckley, looking very pleased with himself because he's no longer staring at a screen of a computer in the bright sunlight waiting, trying to work out what's going on. And we, we, we did a lot more work with this, and we also realized it'd be cool to combine it with other stuff. And again, I don't, I've talked about these sorts of things a lot in the past, but we also combined the laser scanner with one of these, a hyperspectral scanner. So this is a quarry called Renero in, in northern Spain. It's, it's, there's a fault running through the back there. It's limestone and with dolomitization around the fault. So using the hyperspectral imagery combined with the LIDAR imagery, we were able to actually produce a, 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 a classified image classified by composition. So now not only are we mapping the surface and mapping the, mapping the topography, we're also remotely automatically mapping the mineralogy and, 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 the, uh, and the composition. And because you can then map it like this, you could quantify it, you can press a button and it'll tell you that a certain percentage of this cliff is actually made up of zebra dolomite, whatever zebra dolomite is. So, so that's pretty cool. So that's kind of, that's adding to our, to adding to our ability. The other thing is that I like big cliffs. You know, we, we, the geology we want to look at is seismic scale. This is one of my favorite places in the world, the book cliffs. Um, the challenge here with using the LIDAR is that the cliffs are very big. And, and, and you know, to, to get a good image of what's going on, you have to be quite far away. So we, we have this problem that even with a laser scanner that has a range of two kilometers, as you, as to, to, you, you're going to have some of your cliff that's scanned normally. Some of it will be in a shadow, we call a scan shadow. There'll be big, big holes in your model. And some of it is outside of the range. So the solution then was to, to actually take the, the LiDAR system and put it in a helicopter, which you could actually then fly and get the optimal view of the cliff. Now, the challenge is that it relies on, or the LiDAR relies, when it shoots the laser at the cliff, it needs to know where it is to calculate where it shot the cliff. And obviously, as soon as you put it into a helicopter, it's constantly moving. So again, this, this shows how kind of quickly things are moving on. We teamed up with a group called Helimap in Switzerland who developed a system using the same kind of LiDAR. You can see it here. And they hung out the side of the helicopter. And they had all sorts. All of this in here is the, is the missile guidance system out of a cruise missile. And, and, and they kind of managed to get hold of one of these. I don't want to ask how. But anyway, they got hold of one of these. And basically, you flew along the cliff. And now, instead of scanning, instead of scanning like a kilometer or two kilometers in a day, you're able to scan like 30 or 40 kilometers in about an hour or two and collecting some very, very large data sets. And, and basically, what, what it's doing is it's shooting the cliff, but it's also recording exactly where it is, and it's recording all the pitch and roll of the, of the helicopter, and they basically process out that to give you accurate point data. And we collected some great data sets with this, half of the book cliffs, Massive cliffs in Greenland, um, sort of um, loads of stuff in South Africa, all the really big, classic, really big outcrops we collected with that. The challenge with that is that helicopters are very expensive. And those kind of data were, were working out at about 1,600 pounds per, per line kilometer. So it's the same price as acquiring land seismic. So it, it's kind of, it, although it gives you amazing data, it's quite prohibitive. So we're trying to work out how to get around that problem when basically along came the next revolution, drones. Everybody knows about drones now, but back in, the, back in 2012, this seemed extremely exciting. So we, we spent way too much money on this piece of junk, which, <laughs> which basically took an hour to put together. It flew it for about 15 minutes. And, and, and basically our idea was we should be able to fly this along the cliff and, 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 and we should be able to take photographs and everything like that and we should be able to build a 3D model, which, which, which we did. We were able to do that. Um, but it wasn't particularly, it wasn't particularly efficient method of acquiring data because the drone was rubbish. But then the next thing is, as everybody knows, along came DJI and various other companies, but mainly DJI and produced fantastic user drones that cost about £1,000. And, and, and have a 20 megapixel camera on them and do an absolutely amazing job. And I'd say this is the next big revolution, is that we're now able to go out, and in 20 minutes, this is, this is the hillside I did my mapping project on back in 1986, and it took me six weeks of wandering around getting torn to pieces by gorse bushes in northern Spain. Uh, this took me 20 minutes of flying around with a drone to map it. 
and, and basically five or 600 photographs flying around, just taking multiple photographs. The angle's always perfect because you control it. You don't have to, you're not looking up at anything or any of that sort of stuff. And you can produce a, you can see this is a kind of sparse point cloud, but you can produce a point cloud. So the next thing is, you know, where's the laser? You said in the LiDAR you needed a laser. Well, the beauty of this is, is, is the drone revolution kind of came along at the same time as, as a resurgence in something called photogrammetry. Now, photogrammetry is something that's been around for about 100 years, and it bases on the idea of having two photographs. Each photograph is, 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 is the view you see flattened, so it's, it, 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 it's, a kind of, it's a compressed version. And if you pick common points on those photographs, you can actually reconstruct the terrain or the, the, the object in three dimensions. So what this is doing is this is doing this with hundreds and hundreds of photographs, picking millions of 10 million points in the case of that one I just showed you previously, picking millions of points and actually using that to reconstruct the terrain in three dimensions. So this is the principle, multiple photographs, I pick common points, pick the same point in, in, in multiple photographs and I can reconstruct the shape of the object or the shape of the terrain. And as I say, photogrammetry had been around for 100 odd years. It's the sort of basic principles of stereo photography and everything. But, but, but um, there was a transition to a thing called structure from motion. And this is where the, the surveying community, sort of a subset of them, broke away and they did something radical. They, they basically said, actually, you know, um, precision is less important than actually being able to build models quickly. So structure from motion basically is, is a subset of photogrammetry. But it, but, it, but it focuses much more on being able to build models quickly and, and, and producing a, a solution rather than worrying about that centimeter precision or millimeter precision. And basically, they, they also did something radical. They said, yeah, you can have the software. It's free. Go on, take it away. So rather than charging loads and loads of money for it. So basically, a whole bunch of softwares came out that are either cheap, either free, or, or the ones that are good to use are, are actually kind of very, very cheap comparatively, compared to the cost of a laser scanner. Um, and basically, you can build um, very quick 3D models. And then all the advent of Moore's law, computers getting twice as fast every two years and so on, all of that meant that all of a sudden, with a 1,000-pound drone and a 1,000-pound laptop, you can, you can replace a 100,000-pound laser scanner. And all of a sudden, that's a complete kind of democratization of the virtual field trip world or the virtual outcrop world, because pretty much anybody can do it. Now, you've got to be a little bit careful with some of this because the, 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 the computer is, or the, sorry, the drone is, is, is recording a GPS position each time it takes a photograph and it's trying to use that information to scale the model. Again, it's a little bit dark on here, but that's actually, that's actually two models. You can't really see it, but that's the same model. I flew it twice from two different locations and processed them differently. And the interesting thing was that those two models are placed in space 100 meters apart. So that's actually not very accurate, a bit worrying that. But I went in and measured 100 different bed thicknesses in there, and actually there's, 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 there's less than a 5% difference between the two models. So it comes down to what we call precision versus accuracy. So if it's precise, it means that basically that, that model is precise. It's doing exactly the, the, the internal structure of it is consistent. It's just not very accurate. And actually, and actually, you know, you've, what you've got to argue, or you've got to ask yourself is, do I actually care about that? If I'm using that to extract a bunch of channel dimensions or, or shale lengths or something like that, actually, maybe I don't really care where the model is exactly in space. It's good to know it's in Utah. It's good to know which, whereabouts in Utah it is, but it doesn't really matter exactly where it is. And, and actually, if, if I am really worried about that, then actually I can, I can, uh, I can basically go and get a... a, a Differential GPS set, I can put out a bunch of targets in here, and that would actually allow me to constrain the model. So I can put control points in. Now the problem with control points is basically um, it, it will double the time you need to acquire. You actually, I have to go up on that hillside and get scratched to pieces by all of those bushes, which I thought I got away from. Um, so, so putting out control points is possible. Sometimes you really, really want to do it. Sometimes you really, really need that information. It needs to make sure that your model is in the right place. Uh, a lot of time, for, for certainly for what we do, it doesn't actually make any difference. But it, it's a possibility if you need to do it. So basically, where are we now? So we've got cheap, high-quality uh, UAVs or drones. 
We can acquire data quickly. We've got software that allows us to process that data very, very quickly. And ultimately, as I said previously, this is now available to the masses. Virtual outcrops isn't a specialist subject anymore. Anybody can do it. As I say, £1,000 computer, £1,000 worth of drone, and you're good to go. So just to show you a little bit about what we do with some of these, this is just a classic um, little study from one of our MSc students. Here's a virtual outcrop. This one's LiDAR, you can tell, because it's got sort of scan shadows or holes in it. And basically, you just give these data set to the master's students. They get repetitive strain injury, mapping out every single bed boundary, creating overlays, quantifying channel dimensions and shale lengths and all those bar form dimensions and all that kind of good stuff. So this is kind of bread and butter routine um, interpretation work now for, 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 for sort of young geoscientists. Um, and then we will use that to extract things like object dimensions, semi-variograms, um, fascist proportions. We can even use them to create multi-point training, uh, training images for multi-point statistics. So this is the kind of basic stuff that, 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 as I say, has become fairly routine now, but it's still very exciting. Um, we, we do other kinds of studies as well. This is Stromboli. There'll be a, there'll be a virtual field trip on, I think it's on Thursday, to Stromboli, where we took the drone. Again, the picture's a bit dark, but there's a, you can see that there is a little drone flying in here somewhere. And we basically mapped this. We mapped it with a thermal camera as well as a, uh, as a regular RGB camera. And we're at, this is the thermal imagery draped on the lava flow, this lava flow here, lava field here. We've draped thermal imagery over the, over the main kind of... Um, over the main lava flow. And yeah, this is, this is the kind of data that, that really is genuinely exciting because nobody is allowed anywhere near that lava field because it's hot and it's dangerous and there is material constantly coming down from the eruption down this face here. So you, you wouldn't be able to go there, yet we can create really fantastic thermal data sets of what's going on in that lava field. This is just a little side study we've got. You, you may or may not mention, recognize this little fault zone. It's just outside the Arches Visitors Park in in, in Utah, and uh, just outside of Ar the Ar Arches National Park Visitor Center, but there's a little fault zone here. And about 10 years ago, they, wide or they widened the road. And, and so we had a project where we asked the, the, uh, the tectonic studies group kind of um, hive mind on their, on their website, uh, on, their, on their discussion board, did anybody have any pre-2000 photographs of, of this fault zone? So we collected all this, all this uh, heritage data, and we used that to create a 3D model of what the, the cliff section looked like 10 years ago before they made the road wider. And you can actually see that. And that actually allows you to try to reconstruct the three-dimensional geometry of some of those faults. So there's actually kind of there's actually aspects around kind of preserving outcrops that are going to be destroyed or even reconstructing outcrops that don't even exist anymore. Um, if this, this is another thing. If this doesn't send a shiver down your spine, there's, there's going to be a virtual field trip tomorrow. And, it, and if you wonder where this is, it's not Libya, it's not Namibia, it's, it, it's actually, this is actually Mars. And, 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 and the, people working, the people working on Mars rover data have actually got enough, so many photographs and things now that they're actually able to reconstruct Mars in three dimensions. So you can put on a virtual reality headset and actually go and uh, it's almost as good as being there. <laughs> Probably better in some ways. <laughs> So there, there, are, there are a bunch of, you know, how do, you, how do we work with all this? There are a bunch of different softwares now. There's a software called Lime, developed by my colleague Simon Buckley, which you can download for free, which allows you to look at virtual outcrops. Dave Hodgetts' software is also, uh, I think it's available for free, isn't it, to academics? Yeah, for, 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 for looking at these kind of data. Um, there is Move from Midland Valley, which, which you can also upload these models are. So there's no limitations now, or well, there are, there, there are the limitations of actually being able to work with the data are getting less and less because there's all these different softwares are, are, are available. And just have a little, the last five minutes, have a little, whoops, have a little look into the future as to where all of this is going with my Mystic Meg glasses on. So basically, first of all, is that what, one of the things we want to do is actually make, you know, as everybody starts collecting virtual outcrops, we're in a position now where we'd like to really make a lot of these things publicly available. This is a fantastic resource. And actually, it, 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 it's good to share, to, to, to actually make data available. So, so we have our own in-house database of geological models called Safari. It's got about 250 virtual outcrops in it from all over the world. Um, and one of the things we're looking to do towards the end of this year is to make that open to the public. And the view is that not just people come and, and kind of 
take what we've done, but they also use our viewer. We have a specialist 3D viewer that, that allows you to sort of visualize the outcrops directly over the web so you don't need to install any software. So what we would like people to do is, you know, we will store the virtual outcrop that will enable them to share it with the wider community. So, so that's, I think, that's something that's coming in the very near future. And that's, this is just the distribution of the virtual outcrops, basically from pretty much every continent and, and all over the world in different, different sort of depositional environments and rock types and so on. We're working as well with virtual reality. Virtual reality is, is, is you know, is, 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 is actually, this isn't so much looking into the future as this is already here. But this is, a, this is a Thompson Canyon in Utah. We've got a virtual reality model of this. You can, put the, you can put the goggles on like Magda has them there, and you can basically go and kind of wander around in, in, in the outcrop, and you can interact with it. You can make measurements. You can see locations. You can overlay things on it. And this is really going to kind of, I believe this is going to revolutionize the way we, we do field teaching and, and how, we, how we make field data available for people. Augmented reality, this is where you place information over what's in the real world. This is the kind of Google Glasses or HoloLens type thing. Who's been on a field trip where you stand there and somebody says, right, the layer that's just below the bush, no, the green bush next to the big boulder. Right, well, that's, you know, that is with augmented reality. That's a thing of the past because everybody's wearing a glasses. The field trip leader presses a button and, and, you, just get a, uh, and you just get an overlay. And you can make that overlay even more sophisticated. You might lay well logs up there. You might even lay some seismic data or a fluid flow simulation or whatever directly over the outcrop live whilst you're there in the field. Augmented reality in terms of the HoloLens also will mean that we'll be able to sit in the classroom with the outcrop in front of us with three dimensions and sort of point and, and rotate it and spin it around and do all that sort of, that sort of stuff. Well, imagine, you know, you've got Google Earth there. But imagine having paleo maps and things like that there. So I think augmented reality is, is again, it's pretty much here. Tablet-based apps. We just had a, a PhD student who's just completed the first pass of a, of a tablet-based app, which allows you to take the virtual outcrop to the field and start drawing all over it, take extra photographs, lay stuff, lay stuff on it in the field. That's, I think that's going to become more and more mainstream. Um, Automated interpretation. I was fascinated by the talk from Google this morning because this is something, again, we've been really trying to keen to do is if you could take that virtual outcrop, this is a manual interpretation of an outcrop from Spain. It's, it's brown overbank mud sheets and a few, there are a few red channels in there. We tried to train a neural network to actually make that interpretation with a minimal amount of training data. Um, we're not very good at this at the moment. We're learning as we go, but basically we managed to get the number you need to take from there is an 85% match with about a day and a half of fiddling around with it. So again, with somebody who actually knew what they were doing rather than me, this could actually happen very, very quickly, I think, and could be very, very exciting. Because we can train, if we can train, train neural networks to actually interpret these things, we can produce massive amounts of, uh, of, of really useful data very, very quickly. Um, overlaying synthetic seismic, I already said that, but if you can kind of take, this is, some, this is a kilometer high, eight kilometer long, 10 kilometer long outcrop from Greenland, but basically there's, there's a bunch of sills in here. We had a student in, in Norway working on creating synthetic seismic of this, so we can create, automatically create synthetic seismic from virtual outcrops, and again, you can sort of have discussions about seismic resolution and things like that as to what you can and can't see when, you, when you're there. So basically, I think overall, um, why are we using virtual outcrops? We want to bring the outcrop to the workstation. It allows us to access bits of the cliff and things that are too dangerous to get to. It allows rapid collection of huge volumes of data that are all very accurately geospatially constrained. We can potentially even map and quantify mineralogy. And we can have field trips without leaving a desk. And, and everybody thinks, oh no, what a disaster. He's going to stop me going in the field. But actually, it's not about stopping you going in the field at all. What it is about is being able to go sitting at your desk thinking, I don't know what a flood tidal delta looks like, pulling up a virtual field trip to Utah and then another one from South Africa and another one from Spain and going around the world in 20 minutes and actually experiencing all of those things and about calling the reservoir engineer over and going, this is the heterogeneities we're trying to model. Rather than waiting till a field trip, which happens to be next June, and by the time you get to go on that field trip, you've, you've forgotten what the question was. It's also about potentially making field trips better. So we, we, we will now, we routinely now use virtual outcrops before we take the students to the field, saying this is what you're going to see when we go to the field. 
this is what, you know, then, and then afterwards we'll say this is what you saw and they can use it as a, as a revision age. We can also use it for field trips to areas that are politically or logistically challenging. Um, we can use it as for field trips for people who are mobility restricted, allowing everybody to actually go up and see the top of that, top of that cliff section. And it, and it does, there's no doubt, it's going to significantly save costs. You know, sending a bunch of people to Utah for a week costs a lot of money, whereas you know, pulling this stuff up on the workstation can be basically instantaneous. So basically, 200 years of geological mapping, nothing changed, and then a revolution came along. And, and in the last 10 to 15 years, that was very much about specialists. That was about people who had access to LiDAR equipment and specialist software, uh, and, and we're doing all this kind of stuff. But in the last three or four years, basically, I would say that has become available to anybody working in the geosciences. So I think, I think we've seen that transition from specialist kind of niche area to, 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 to something that's absolutely kind of available for everybody to use. And it's, it is genuinely revolutionizing how we collect data in the field and how we use that, that, that data. And, and the interesting thing about this is, is it's is evolving. So I, mean, I feel really old because I try to read tech mags and things like that to keep up. But every time you have a vague idea, somebody suddenly, you realize that somebody in a parallel industry has already been doing that for two or three years and everything just move, is moving on and changing so quickly that, it, that it's almost breathtaking. It, it's, it's a very, very exciting time to be working in this field. So with that, I'd like to say thank you to our sponsors. And also thank you to all the various students and things whose work I've kind of flashed up here while I've been whizzing through this.